Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thank you for joining us on this Sunday evening. We've got a busy show tonight. They make up about 10 to 15 percent of voters in this city. Black Chicagoans who are casting their ballots for the grand old party. Two of them share their thoughts on the party's platform. Also, do you have a favorite Toni Morrison novel? And before we came to this country and a little bit afterwards, black people could fly. This week's throwback, we revisit a 1977 conversation the famed author had with our John Calloway. And the death of actor Chadwick Boseman this past summer put colon cancer in the black community in the spotlight. We speak to a doctor on why the fictional Wakandans in the superhero action film Black Panther might have had a low rate of cancer and what you should look for. We wanted to reclaim this corner with art. And as arts correspondent Angel Edo shows us, neighbors in this community are making their voices heard with this art form. But first, some of the top stories from this past week. Louisville police say they knocked and identified themselves repeatedly for a minute or more before using a battering ram to enter Breonna Taylor's apartment back in March. This comes from the audio recordings of the grand jury released late last week under court order. Taylor was killed in a hail of gunfire after her boyfriend fired on the officers, striking one of them. The recordings also show that her boyfriend told the grand jury that they never heard the officers knock or announce themselves. Last month, the grand jury decided not to indict the officers in Taylor's death, prompting further protests. Election day is a month away, but if you just can't wait, early voting has begun at the city's Loop Super site. On the first day of early voting last week, voters formed a socially distanced line outside the building to cast their ballots. Early voting sites open in all 50 wards on October 14th. Meanwhile, the Chicago Board of Elections says nearly half a million people have requested vote by mail ballots. The board recommends returning them as soon as possible. The board also says that distancing masks, hand sanitizers and plexiglass dividers will be used at all polling locations. Again, Election Day is November 3rd. And trick or treating isn't canceled, but it will look different this year. Mayor Lori Lightfoot announced the city's guidelines for Halloween this week. While trick or treating isn't banned, the mayor says groups should be smaller than six. Always keep it moving, people, and everyone should wear masks, including candy givers. However, haunted houses and house parties of any size are not allowed. The city plans to host pop up parties dubbed Hollow Week during the week leading up to the holiday. The reality is people are going to trick or treat. So we're, we're dealing with that reality. We're trying to spread it out um, over the course of the week. But the reality is uh, Halloween is a great holiday. We all have fun with it, as you can see. Um, and uh, but we want people to do it safely. And so putting out some very specific uh, guidelines, dealing with the reality. The mayor and commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health, Dr. Allison Arwady, dressed up as the Rona destroyers for the announcement, even giving candy to some reporters. And be sure to check out our website for the latest from WTTW News. Up next, we speak to what some may consider a rarity in Chicago, black Republicans. Stick around. Chicago Tonight, Black Voices is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Compared to the rest of the country, Republicans are a rarity in Chicago. Somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of Chicago voters punch their ballots with the GOP. And Republicans are even tougher to find in the black community, which has voted overwhelmingly Democratic since the mid-1960s. But our next guests say they'd like to see more black Republicans and more specifically black Trump supporters. Joining us to talk about why they believe black Americans should give the Republican Party their votes are Anthony Anderson, president of the Republican Precinct Project, and Patricia Easley, who recently formed a conservative political action committee named the Wells Washington Douglas Society. Welcome both of you to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Anthony, let's start with you, please. How do you believe the Republican Party and the current administration are helping the black community? 
Well, one way I think that the Republican organization or the Trump administration is helping the black community is by doing the uh, opportunity zones, the historical black funding for the colleges, the uh, First Step Act, uh, and helping black unemployment rates stay down. And also just recently announced the $500 billion uh, investment into the black community. And so I think that will go a long way uh, into empowering black communities of which, you know, a lot of can be contributed, the downfall can be contributed to, you know, delinquent uh, Democrat policies. And when you were referring to that $500 uh, million plan, you're referring to the so-called platinum plan uh, that the president and his campaign unveiled shortly before uh, the presidential uh, debate. Yes, ma'am. Yes, a a absolutely. Absolutely. It will be a shot in the arm, and it's, it's just to start. I mean, if you look at the, the decades of decadence within the black community, brought on by politicians from both parties. I think that this is a, this is a shot in the right direction. This is definitely uh, a, the direction that blacks need to be headed for, uh, for, for, for the foreseeable future. So yes, this is a perfect opportunity uh, for, for Trump and uh, Republicans to take advantage of the situation in terms of you know, helping black, uh, black Americans. Uh, Patricia Easley, are there specific policies uh, from the Republican platform that you would like to see enacted in the future? Actually, I think that the most important platform or the most important policy is to get eliminate sanctuary cities and states. There has been countless research that shows that illegal immigration negatively impacts the economic situation in the black community because typically those um, labor jobs were going to black men who did not go to college. And now those black men and women were excluded from that particular workforce because it's now filled with illegal workers. So what my president was able to do was to enforce immigration employment laws here in the city of Chicago with one bakery in particular, uh, which is over in the Galewood, um, Belmont, Cragen area. Once there's factories were rated for illegal workers, my neighbors in Austin went and got those jobs. So we can see the immediate impact of that. Um, another thing that we should be focused well, on Patricia, is- Patricia, one, one, I want to follow up on that really quickly, if I can, yes, just because obviously, you know, the, the black community here experiences, has experienced decades of disinvestment in those communities. Some of it predates, um, you know, the increased Latino population uh, that we see today. How, I mean, you've given us one example, um, but how is it that you think deportation uh, will help to fix the, the actual issues that exist in, in the black communities with regard to housing, healthcare, and education? So um, in regards to those things, well, I do know that our tax dollars are currently being used to subsidize those families who are here um, in a number of ways. So even if we were to look at the most basic level, the tax dollars that are being used to subsidize people um, in our sanctuary city, what could be used for to address the issues in our community? That's the first thing. But I also want to talk about, when we talk about immigration, we also have to talk about border control. Right now, 90% of the heroin in the United States of America is trafficked off of the west side of Chicago. The cartel chose my neighborhood on the west side of Chicago to be its American headquarters because Chicago is a sanctuary city, because of our high black male unemployment and our um, access to transportation. So lax border control is directly impacting our lives here on the west side of Chicago and throughout the country because we know that we have an op opioid crisis as well. So and, if sorry, we... It and yep. sorry, I just want to get Anthony back in here um, just because, you know, that we've known of a few, a handful of high profile uh, black Republicans, former Secretary of State uh, Condoleezza Rice, as well as uh, Colin Powell, uh, the current uh, Housing and Urban Development Secretary, ben, Dr. Ben Carson. Anthony, why do you think there are so few black Republicans? Well, I think part of the problem was in the past, there really hasn't been, there, there was a lot of talk about reaching out to the African-American community, but that was just, it was just a lot of talk. And so I think fast forward to today's date, I think the party is finally realizing that, hey, listen, in order for us to start winning elections, we have to reach out to uh, those disaffected communities, especially in the, back, the black community. Because if you look at the black community, it has been uh, decade after decade after decade of disenfranchisement. And so with, with that in mind, this again would be the perfect opportunity for the Republican party to reach out to the African American, American community and ask, hey, listen, what is it that we can do to help uh, gain your vote, and if we could do that, I think we'll go we'll go uh, far we'll go far for sure. Now, and that so said, I think though, that's going to be a winning strategy that in the said, future. 
President Trump has taken some criticism this past week in particular for not quite denouncing white supremacy. Uh, what was your reaction to his comments, the, well, the stand back and stand by comment at Tuesday's debate? Here's my here's my reaction, because I'm a former Marine and in the Marine Corps, we had a thing that, that said stand down. And so when I when I hear the word stand down, that that means to me, hey, listen, stop what you're doing, period. End of story, cut and dry. Now, the president has since 2016 denounced and renounced racism. And so at this point, how many times does the president has to keep saying the same old thing? And no matter which president is, office, is in office as a Republican, whether it be Bush 43, Bush 41, or, or even, uh, you know, any Republican who ran for president, such as John McCain or uh, Mitt Romney, they're all considered racist by the media. And you just have to get past that and understand that these guys are not going to give you a fair shake when it comes to trying to, uh, you know, put you in his peg in terms of trying to call you a racist in the Republican Party. Patricia, you're white go ahead, Patricia. We've got about 15 <laughs> seconds. Yeah, this president is the first and only president in U.S. history to declare the Ku Klux Klan a terrorist organization. And I think that we should give him more credit for that because they are the quintessential white terrorist group in this country. And we had a black president for eight years who said nothing about them. This president has declared them terrorists. So when we talk about him denouncing terrorists or white supremacists, he has taken the ultimate step by make by designating the Ku Klux Klan as a terrorist organization that will be prosecuted as such by the Department of Justice. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, a lot more to come this election season, of course. My thanks to Anthony Anderson and Patricia Easley for joining us on Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much for having me. Up next, examining high rates of colon cancer in the black community. But first, on October 8, 1993, writer Toni Morrison won the Nobel Prize for Literature. She was the first woman and the first black American to win the award. In the announcement, the Nobel Foundation said she, quote, gave life to an essential aspect of American reality with her novels. Morrison died last year at age 88. In this week's throwback, here she is in 1977, talking with John Calloway about her novel, Song of Solomon. That's what I was thinking all the way through this oh, book. Oh, yeah. it's true, yeah. Joan and the Whale, it's one's own personal demon that one must fight alone. You do go into the depths in order to um, rise. Is again. that true for you personally? Oh, yes. Tell me about your depths. No. <laughs> I really no, who can't. are you? It's, uh, it's obvious from reading <laughs> you that you're a person of deep experience. What happened to you when you were growing up? And w Did you grow up in Lorraine, Ohio? Yes. What was it like? Well, I remember two kinds of Lorraine, Ohio's. Uh, one is the one that I recollect now, which is lovely and nostalgic, and I, I remember it with an enormous amount of fondness. All my family lives there now, and my sisters, my brothers, my mother, so I think of it with a lot of affection. But when I remember it factually, I know that it was not quite like that. There were moments of sadness. I wasn't allowed to swim in Lake Erie for most of my childhood there. And there were places we were not allowed to go. The sustenance and the juice came from my family and my friends and my family's friends. But the difficulty is, is leaving and, and wanting something just a little bit different. That was Toni Morrison there. It's becoming more common for young black adults to contract colon cancer in the U.S. The medical community is working to bring awareness to this disparity and screenings for the disease following the recent death of actor Chadwick Boseman. Boseman, who is probably best known for portraying the Marvel comic book character Black Panther, died from colon cancer in August at 43 years old. In a conversation recorded earlier, I spoke with Dr. Ed McDonald, a gastroenterologist and associate director of adult nutrition at University of Chicago Medicine. When Black Panther was first released, McDonald wrote about why he thinks the fictional Wakandans would be at a lower risk of getting colon cancer. I began by asking him why he chose then to focus on colon cancer. So the movie came out uh, in March, the same month as uh, Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and it was a very popular movie, a movie that had a lot of cultural significance for African Americans, and I thought it would be a good idea to 
kind of marry the, the significance of that movie with the significance of our increased risk of developing colon cancer. And I used that movie to basically talk about colon cancer screening and prevention. Um, and one of the arguments that I made in Wakanda, it seemed like people embrace technology. And we have a lot of technology that exists that can actually help prevent colon cancer or at least lead to early detection of colon cancer, which can decrease the risk of dying from colon cancer. You also uh, wrote about some of the other reasons why Wakandans would be at lower risk. Yeah, so there was a character in the movie that indicated that uh, some of the Wakandans are vegetarians. So we know that adopting a plant-focused diet, uh, which can include being vegan, being plant-based or pescatarian or Mediterranean diet, but ideally a diet where the plants are really the main, main part of the main component of the diet, can potentially decrease the risk of developing colon cancer. Uh, other reasons, uh, the Wakandans seem to exercise, so we know that weight can um, play a role when it comes to increasing our risk of developing colon cancer, and exercise can also decrease the role of de developing colon cancer. So these are all lifestyle factors that can play a role uh, that we all should really think about, when we're, especially after seeing what happened to Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman. Now, in Cook County, blacks are 26% uh, more likely to get colon and rectal cancers than white people. Why this disparity? It's complicated. Uh, so in Cook County, I mean, there's, there's a lot of issues involved in not only developing any type of cancer, but also having an opportunity to get screened for cancer. So screening rates are a little bit lower in the African American community community than uh, compared to white white people, um, but they're not that much lower. So, you know, this is just the difference that we're seeing is not because people are just not getting colonoscopies. Uh, there's something else going on. Uh, so we know that the food plays a role. We know that um, exercise, again, can also play a role, but there are genetic factors. And then, you know, there's also structural racism involved. So we know that people of lower incomes also have a higher risk of developing cancer. And there's a variety of different reasons why, you know, all these different social determinants can affect colon cancer outcomes. But when we think about solutions, we, have to have, we also have to have all these different issues in mind when we're coming up with plans for solutions, because it's deeper than just telling people to get a colonoscopy. We have to look at uh, access to colonoscopy. We also have to look at lifestyle. What are, uh, among some of the factors, are any chronic gut conditions uh, potentially factors, for example, uh, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? Yeah, so Crohn's, ulcerative colitis uh, carry increased risk of developing colon cancer, uh, primarily because these are inflammatory conditions. So most of the colon cancers that we're talking about for colon cancer screening, those are sporadic colon cancers, which is different than uh, the colon cancer that's associated with inflammation. But people who do have inflammatory bowel disease, they should have colon cancer screening on their radar. Um, how soon should people be getting uh, colonoscopies? And also, what are the other factors that might, that might you know, make those colonoscopies happen earlier in your life rather than the standard recommendation, which I believe is 50? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a little bit of controversy with the standard recommendation. So recently, the American Cancer Society increased or decreased the age in which they recommend colon cancer screening to age 45 for all Americans. Now, other societies, such as the American Gastroenterology Association, they still recommend pursuing colonoscopy at age 50 for the average American. Now, however, African Americans across the board are now recommended to have colonoscopy started at age 45. Now, and that, that's if you don't have a family history. If you have a family history of colon cancer, then you may have to start at age 40 or uh, 10 years younger than your family member was diagnosed with colon cancer. So if someone was diagnosed say, at age 45, that person should start colonoscopy, their colon cancer screening at, at age 35. What are, what if, you know, if you're a little bit younger and we've got just about 60 seconds left, you know, what are some of the symptoms that someone might, uh, might consider going to see a doctor for? So with colon cancer screening, the whole point of it is uh, majority of colon cancers and polyps don't have any symptoms. So that's why people have to come in at particular ages because we don't want you to develop symptoms. Now, for people who may be experiencing symptoms like blood in the stool, I would say that warrants a conversation with the physician, especially if you're over the age of 30. Um, so blood in the stool can indicate cancer. It's not, not 
hands down a, a, the sole sign of cancer. There's, there's a lot of different things that can cause blood in the stool, but nonetheless, that warrants an evaluation and discussion with a, at least a primary care doctor or gastroenterologist. Uh, other symptoms could include severe constipation, but again, you know, there's a lot of reasons to have constipation that don't involve colon cancer. So I don't want people to get too alarmed, but I do want people to actually have conversations with health professionals about the symptoms they're experiencing. But Bottom also line. recognize that colon cancer can be asymptomatic. Bottom line, see your doctor if something weird is going on. Dr. Ed Definitely. McDonald, <laughs> Dr. Ed McDonald, thank you so much. I know we're catching you in between procedures, so thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. And we're back with more right after this. I'm Paris Schutz. This week on Chicago Tonight, the head of Chicago's FBI office on what that agency is doing to ensure a fair election and the fight to save a beloved discount mall in Chicago's Little Village neighborhood. That's all this week at 7 here on 11. A family of artists is encouraging communities to reclaim their neighborhoods through the art of storytelling. Arts correspondent Angel Edo recently brought us this story. Here's another look. The intersection of 71st and Jeffrey was once described as the main artery of the South Shore neighborhood, but that has since changed as disinvestment and blight now stand in its place. So artist Dorian Sylvain decided to reclaim the corner with art. So we feel that this corner is such an important intersection for the community, the children, the seniors, the neighbors that live here, that reclaiming it artistically it doesn't change the fact that this building is still abandoned, but it does tackle the, um, the psychological uh, stress of seeing abandoned properties everywhere you look. Mural Moves, a campaign executed by Sylvain and her artistic children, has been working to help beautify black and brown businesses during the pandemic. I love working with them. But also it's about kind of passing down skills, passing down legacy, passing down ideas of citizenship and how we as artists uh, have commitments to our, our neighborhood. They invited artists from the neighborhood to volunteer their time and invest in their community. You know, a lot of our neighborhoods are in the condition they're in because they're neglected, especially in the arts. I just want to make sure that I use my art as a form of protest because I think my slogan is art is my weapon. I may not be out there on the front lines fighting and you know whatever whatever the case may be I just feel like this is my way of showing my solidarity with the movement to help advance the culture to the level it's supposed to be. It's an opportunity for anyone to come out and share their story. That's how 10-year-old Ashe Williams ended up painting this. She was just walking down the street with her parents and decided to stop. I just hope that they like it if they want to. They don't have to like it. Sylvain's son, Kahari, says it's intersections like these that speak to the necessity behind their work. Cultivating um, younger artists is really important and like mentorship and having like um, people that have experience that you can talk to about about it is uh, it's just a big part of the game. With the help of a few students, art teacher Juarez Hawkins created a piece that references a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We wear the mask that grins and lies. So that's really applicable to what we're going through now, sort of like as people of color are facing really what they've been facing for the past three, four hundred years, but now it's like the scab is ripped off publicly. But at the same time, it's like that's how we always have to keep our cool and we have to keep our calm and we have to find find ways to survive and to thrive in spite of all the crazy. It, it kind of brighten your spirit, make your spirit feel a little lighter, you know. For Arlene Turner Crawford, it was about paying tribute to late civil rights activist Dr. Conrad Worrell with a phrase that she believes embodies his work. Candace Hunter continued a series she started when the pandemic began titled Brown Limb Girls. The figures in the piece are just about joy, about sunshine and life and um, loving being in the skin they're in. It's this message and many others shared at this intersection that reflect the long-term impact of Sylvain's mission. We all just want to be heard and not everybody has a capacity to draw beautiful things and, and sometimes people just want to write their name on the wall. 
you know. Um, but it, it is about giving people that platform, giving people an opportunity that doesn't feel intimidating. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. Mural Moves has since gone on to create artwork now on display at the Forum in Bronzeville on 43rd Street, just a few blocks west of King Drive. And the Hyde Park Art Center, once businesses begin to remove the boards, they plan to mount them in Chicago public schools. In the meantime, they're still taking requests online. You can visit our website for more. And that's our show for this Sunday night. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com slash news for the very latest from WTTW News. And be sure to join Paris Schutz and me tomorrow at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, representing dozens of families in the crash of a Boeing 737 MAX 8 jet. Mr. Clifford has been named lead counsel in litigation in federal court in Chicago.